Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of fair quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind, a collection of quotes taken from what's often called the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which long ago, as I understand it, was referred to by some as philosophical medicine or narrative medicine, helping one to be their own story doctor to use narrative medicine to heal themselves. And we now have 2,000 pages worth of quotes. Can you believe it? 10,000 advanced self-help quotes. Um, roughly 90% of them come from the shrinks, uh, but they're selected for their clarity, for their friendliness, for their warmth, uh, for being kind of, uh, kind of clear. Right? And um, roughly 10% uh, on the lighter end from the self-help authors from self-help authors who are psychologically or psychoanalytically minded. Um, and we've got a few hundred quotes uh, just from films, uh, TV shows, uh, a few poems here and there on the lighter end. Oh, I got a bird here. All right. <laughs> oh, yeah, so I just noticed by chance, uh, at the moment, there aren't many, there aren't people here at the pool but I might last only a few minutes here. I'll see if I can go to the other end when people start coming in. Yeah, yeah. so um, I'm kind of excited um, uh, that a uh, single page, by the way, a single, uh, single space, pardon me. T 2,000 pages of quotes, single space. Uh, I think it's 4MG, whatever that is, megabytes or something. Uh, it's, so it's an encyclopedia of insights. Um, now, these quotes, um, uh, to the best as I can see them to be fit uh, Grice's uh, criteria for communication. Okay, quantity, quality, relevance, manner. Right? So quantity, yeah. So the average quote is like this, right? Like one or two sentences long, right? Um, yeah, so by the way, in this video, uh, we'll be doing, uh, let's see, TQ2716. Uh, so something like this, right? So. You know, there might be a paragraph here and there, occasional longer passage, sometimes just like a little phrase that defines a term. Uh, for example, one today says, humans are relationship seeking from birth. I thought that was a paraphrase, a nice paraphrase of Fairbairn's famous line, um, that life force is object seeking. So it's pretty obvious, but it's nice to have it sort of said clearly. All of the baby's life force, it's about finding and a connection, the attachment. His life force, his energy, he's searching for the nipple, the breast to, to latch and suckle. His life force is to that end, right? So uh, that's sort of the emphasis here. Right? So uh, humans are relationship seeking. That's sort of the basic thing, right? Um, now, if the baby gets a secure attachment, uh, he can uh, develop emotionally to the psychological birth. And then if there's a problem there, uh, we need narrative medicine to be aware of it and then to uh, kind of lay the ghost to rest to allow our life force to enjoy the present. So it's a whole, it's a whole there's a whole, uh, actually our first quote maybe partially summarizes it. We use a language, um, so psychoanalysis is a kind of perspective, language, orientation. Um, we use a language of relevance between the here and now repetitions to tap into each partner's unconscious history. The context here is with couples, right? We use a language, so like therapists, right? Therapists uh, use a language, or we use a language of relevance between the here and now repetitions to tap into each partner's unconscious history. A here and now interpretive emphasis implies that there had to be a there and then pattern that is continuing to wreak havoc. So Aletha Horner puts it this way, the interpersonal leads to the intrapsychic, which then expresses itself interpersonally. As above, so below, inside out. So we study this. The interpersonal leads to memories, okay, called intrapsychic. And whatever, whatever is set down there by the age of three, it's gonna express itself, show itself, reveal itself um, interpersonally later on. So we study this because if the child has a intrapsychic that's based on a painful inter original interpersonal, right? so that's what we study, right? Um, 
So the object relations theory is the study of the internalization okay, of interpersonal relationships. Interpersonal relationships, he internalizes it as above, so below, and then inside out, right? So he says, so he says it here as well. Um, we use the language of relevance. Let's see, can I get it in like this? Let's see. Does it work? Can I read it like this? Hang on a sec. Let's try this. Does that work? Oh, I can't see that. Will you? <laughs> a new experiment here. I've recently started uh, printing out because uh, I'm having a heck of a time finding outlets and rooms where I can plug in the computer, bring in the speaker. So I, I, I send this to a print shop, print it out, you know, make a detour to get the print out and find, find a place. Plus, I've only got two hours of storage. I'm still having tech issues. Um, so we're going to do it this way for the time being. Uh, so our first quote in today's batch, we use a language of relevance between the here and now repetitions, here and now repetitions, that's the pattern, the ongoing dysfunctional pattern. Edna Burgler says, every neurotic is a music enthusiast, but he only has one record. He carries this one record with him everywhere he goes. Every time he sees a record player with never ending fiery ardor, he spins off that tune. Okay. That record he creates, that's the intra psychic. He expresses it in new situations again and again. Okay. So we use the language of relevance between the here and now repetitions. The repetition, what's the repetition? If the child has a painful memory, has unfinished business with his mother, he can't live with the memory of the mother hurting him, not meeting his needs, and he's frozen there. Okay. The trauma uh, clicks into the organism's attempt at heal, to heal that. So because the baby doesn't understand time, all time is that time. So he carries the past into the present, because in the present is still the emotional past. Replays the record or the cry for love to get out of that pain. Huh? Again, we use the language, we use the language. Yeah, I can. Let's, try, let's try again, let's see. I almost got it, let's see. We use, I can't, uh, we use, okay, yeah, it's too blurry. <laughs> We use the language of relevance. How about like this? Does that work? I do this one. We, we use we use the language of relevance. We use the language of relevance between the here and now repetitions to tap into each partner's unconscious history. Um, a here and now interpretive emphasis. A here and now interpretive emphasis implies that there had to be a there and then. That's the intrapsychic. A there and then, that's the template, that's the schema, that's the script, that's the working model, that's the endopsychic structure, intrapsychic structure, okay, the architecture there, the, the child's memories, uh, in, in, neural pathways, motivation, fantasies. He's got a psychic structure there. He's got deep memories, basic, simple, classical conditioning. Okay? If the baby's one with the mother in the beginning, okay? and he didn't get enough love to separate from her, and, he, and he's stuck there, okay? that, fusion, that unresolved fusion, it's going to express itself interpersonally later on with the fantasy of, of having blissful union with somebody because they didn't get it back in the mother. They transferred the mother onto the present and hope that the person in the present could be the good mother that was needed back in the past to see what the magical fantasy that can change the past, undo the past, right? So repetition compulsion is the fantasy that when we recreate, relive with the mother, with somebody else in the present, in some way or another that represents the past, we have the fantasy that by replaying the past and the present, Okay, the present becomes the presenting past. The, pa the present is like a new addition or recreation of the past. The fantasy is that the, the person emotionally is going to get their needs met, i.e., the emotionality doesn't understand time, but there is time. So, in effect, the person is hoping to undo the past, change the past, get the love that was needed in the past, correct the past, get mother's love from the past. It doesn't work because there is time. Well, it's a one-way ticket. You can't travel back on a time machine kind of thing. So we look at this kind of thing. Well, there had to be a there and then pattern that is continuing to wreak havoc. Well, that's, that's the trauma. That's the, the wreck havoc. It makes us dysfunctional. What he says here, continuing to wreck havoc, what he means here is the neurosis. Neurosis, dysfunction. It's wrecking havoc on a person's life. Neurosis is the petrification, the freezing the deep burning in his brain, the deep memories, okay, the template of an inner conflict, inner conflict, 
Okay, for baby's identity, he has needs. For his developmental growth, those needs, mother was misattuned to those needs, malattuned to the baby's needs. Baby had feelings around him. Mother's, mother didn't get it. Okay, that's uh, a deep memory around that. Okay, and this is an ongoing conflict, okay? inner conflict. Baby has needs, he's afraid to know his needs. He's afraid that if he did know his needs, he'd have he'd feel, and then the mother rejected the feeling, double insult. Simple classical conditioning, the wish and the fear. Baby makes a basic equation. Well, to have needs and feelings leads to pains. To avoid the pain, don't have needs and feelings. That's an inner conflict. This is all repressed. It's getting hot out here. Let me get a bit of shade here. Hold on a sec. Because I'm baking out here. Yeah. How about here? That's a little better, right? Uh, okay. Let's try this. Let me get some kind of prop here. Hold on a sec. Let me. Let, let me use my ridiculously overpriced tourist coffee here. Hold on a sec. Is that holding it? All right. Oops. Lost the light. Oh, here we go. Maybe I can move the chair here. Hold on a sec. Let me. Uh, let's. Uh, yeah. Let's just move the chair here. Hold on a sec. Sorry if you see me perspiring or something. It's just so nice to do it outdoors for a while for a change. Um, yeah, it says 30 something, but it, with the heat index, it's close. It's 40 or over 40. So I'm holding out here, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Burglar says, um, neurosis is the petrification of an inner conflict that's repressed. It's repressed. When something's repressed, it's gonna somehow um, be projected or expressed interpersonally later on okay so projection or this repetition or this recreation is like a mirror to know the intrapsychic uh, a simple version of this is projection okay in general something about ourselves if we were to admit it know it believe it consider it recognize that it's ours to do so would bring up a lot of anxiety the memories of the pain the memories of mother's misattunement so to avoid feeling those kinds of feelings the trick of the mind is, whatever belongs to us, it's there. We trick ourselves to think it's not there by saying someone else has this, feels this, does this, want this, needs this, uh, didn't get this, and so on, right? So you project it, it's still within, but it's a trick of the mind to make you believe that it's not within. At the same time, you're creating a mirror, Lachlan calls it a mirror defense. So it helps you not feel the pain that you would feel if you were to admit it, so you say it's outward. At the same time, you're creating a mirror, okay? Because the unconscious self wants you to know and heal. So it's creating a mirror uh, to bring these, to bring your repressed material psychic elements to consciousness. So the line is, projection is the means of bringing repressed material to consciousness. Okay? So when something's painful, it's gonna be expressed. That's a mirror to know what's going on within, right? We use the language of relevance between the here and now repetitions to tap into each partner's unconscious history. A here and now interpretive emphasis implies that there had to be a there and then pattern. A there and then pattern in the nursery. Look to the nursery, the breastfeeding, the feeding time. Look to the nursery. There was a there and then pattern. Okay, that's, that's problematic. That froze the baby up. Okay, he wants to get out of that freezing. He doesn't want to feel numb and sleepwalk through life, go through the motions of life, feeling that life, life is passing him by, and still have this uh, feel, feeling numb inside or feeling frozen, petrified, turned to stone, feeling unreal. So all of these um, stories, like the Velveteen Rabbit feeling unreal, or that, um, that carpenter guy who took a block of wood and carved out this little boy and then was praying for the boy to come to life, so the reader of these stories say, yeah, I want to feel more real, I want to come more to life. Um, the common image is freezing, petrification, and echo turns to stone. 
Okay. The jargon is Alex Thymia, no words of feelings, because we don't know where our feelings are because we're afraid to admit our needs, which would lead to the feelings. So we're even afraid to say what we need, because needs and feelings are linked, right? So if this is all squelched in the baby, okay, needs and feelings are squelched. Needs and feelings is like the soul of the child. It's his embodiment. It's his sense of self. It's his feeling self. It's his ontological self. It's his I feel, therefore I am this self. Okay, the image is uh, the princess on the field in the distance sees a polar bear playing with the golden reef in the white bear King Valamon story. So the metaphor is um, the, the young, uh, the maiden was, uh, or the princess was drawn to this image of the golden reef first, right? Approaches the polar bear, okay, once upon a time, long ago in a faraway land. <laughs> Approaches the polar bear and said, hey, polar bear, that golden reef you got there, I, I'm really drawn to it, I really love it. Said, Come on, hand it over, will you? <laughs> polar bear says, it's not that simple. We're a package deal. Okay, and the story goes from there. I won't uh, do the story here today. The, the image is the embodiment. The, the polar bear was a metaphor for like the body, in, being embodied, you're animate your body, right? And then when, you, when you're in your body, when you feel comfortable um, um, to know that you're in the body, you're, 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 the golden reef is like the golden ball that radiates. Okay? It sparkles, it shines. There's a kind of a, uh, you feel embodied and I feel therefore I am. It's kind of linked like that, right? So um, when Odysseus got home to a psychic house, Ithaca, Penelope came in. So it's kind of together like that. So he got his, his, his amnes, this, that's Ithaca, the psychic house. Again, we all live in a psychic house called the Soul Castle. So he got back to his inner home. Remember Odysseus wanted to find home? He got back to, it's a metaphor for inner life, right? And then he got reunited with his feelings, the Penelope came in, right? So I feel there for amnes. Okay. So it's kind of linked like that. You can't really have your golden ball without um, the polar bear. See, she had to um, accept two of them as a package kind of thing, right? But if you don't feel your feelings, that means you don't feel your sense of self. Kristen Wilson says, yeah, if, if you're in that condition, um, well, her line is, if you're not in your body, you're not making sense, literally. And then it's all this disembodied discourse that causes so much pain, misery, havoc. We're not making sense. Because in disembodied discourse, what's going on is, they're trying to find their golden ball. Okay? If they're, they're grasping, uh, they're confused, they're in a panic, what are they trying to do? They're trying to, somehow in their fantasy, find the good mother that was needed in the past. So games, people play, duplicity, lies, misleading, tricky people, getting other people to, getting others to feel what you don't know you're feeling. Because the fantasy is, if others are feeling what you're feeling and you don't even know what you're feeling it, then you got the fantasy that in the original setup, the baby nursing with the breast mother, they're one. From the baby's perspective, they're one. So if the baby's feeling something, the mother's feeling something. She's feeling the same thing because they're one. If they're one, they're feeling the same thing, but the mother uh, gets the message and it provides the soothing. So they're trying to recreate that. It's not, nobody's making sense. Nobody in the present is the breast mother for the nursery. That's the power of the unconscious. When there's trauma so early on in the brain, there's no time there. And we're carrying that timelessness. Uh, no time, infinite, uh, pro pain, right, uh, into the present and recreating, reliving that original interaction with the mother, with others in the present in some form or another, uh, still replaying the record, mother, I need your love, I need your reverie, I need your attunement, I need a positive maternal experience with you, I need to feel safe with you for a few months after birth, I need you to accept me while I'm kind of separating from you, I need your support while I'm getting to know myself, I need these kind of basic needs, and if that's all rejected some, at some point between birth and three, he freezes up inside. When there's a freezing up inside, okay, the, image of the, the image is the golden ball goes down the well, locked in a cage. Okay, something pure or innocent like a baby or children lost in the forest. Again, forest, the symbol for the unconscious, dark, unknown, what's in there, you can't see it. Okay, in the Adelana myth, the king puts, sends the baby into the forest. Like, whoa, some pure little innocent baby lost in the forest image, metaphor, that something pure is unknown to us. It's, we can't see it. It's, it's in the non-reporting brain. Yeah. So it means it gets recorded in a part of the brain called the non-reporting brain, the implicit memory system, the pre-verbal memory system. How's lighting here? We doing okay? That's kind of cool to get the pool. It's nice to get the pool. Oh boy, no one's come out yet, eh? 
All right. Oh, that's great. Well, this is a rare uh, experience. So my first time to have uh, the pool for so long. Yeah. This is, I'll, I'll enjoy this rare moment here. Yeah. Let's settle, let's settle down. Um, so what we're trying to do here, just like see this crane. I don't know if you can see the crane there. They're, they're these guys, these construction workers are building this building which when complete will house people. Oh, we need a, we need a level of consciousness. Um, now, I don't know how many bricks are, it, are there in this building, but... Uh, okay, uh, anyways, it, it, when they build the building, it'll house people. Okay, when we build our knowledge with these 10,000 quotes, for example, it, it, it'll be able to house our feelings, you know? So it's a, just a ballpark approximate metaphor. Psychoanalysis looks for an egg in a basket that's missing. Weave the basket, then the egg. Just like make the building, then the people. Okay, so build this kind of consciousness, then it, then it's kind of safe um, for our inner, for our own inner memories to kind of reveal itself. The egg, the potential comes back to ourselves. Right? So we first weave the basket and let healing happen. Healing is going to happen on its own time, on its own schedule. We just uh, welcome it it's by we, here's a basket. Uh, so the bird first builds a nest, then there can be an egg. Okay, so first things first. Um, okay, so another, so the, the image of trauma that we're talking, okay, trauma. We're talking about developmental trauma, okay, called attachment trauma. The baby must attach to his mother, meaning a secure attachment, a good enough secure attachment. Okay, where the baby, where the mother meets the baby's, oh, look at that, eh? The baby shouldn't meet the baby's needs. See, some mothers, when they want to, when some mothers trick the baby to use the baby to meet her needs, okay, the baby's traumatized. That's an attachment trauma, a severe attachment trauma, if that takes place. Mothers are not supposed to use the babies to comfort them, okay, and, and she can easily fix it that way. She can easily uh, create a kind of a dependency by the child onto her, so the mother feels always seen, always needed, never alone, somebody always there. Okay? And uh, in the last video, oh my God, yeah, in the last video, we did a quote about uh, um, Doris. Yeah, Doris. Check out that last quote about Doris. Yeah, that, that's a good example of the Jocasta style of mothering. The Jocasta style of mothering means when a mother uses the baby to meet her needs. Okay? And we, we have uh, four uh, examples of that. Um, Doris is just like one uh, example within the, one category of examples. Um, yeah, okay, so um, if uh, the baby's born with uh, vitality feelings, it's natural, right? I feel therefore I am. Now he has needs to develop that, to continue. But if his, if his needs don't get met, uh, first of all, joy and sadness and the golden ball get souped away. So. The golden ball goes down the well, okay? Golden ball means um, vibrancy of feelings, aliveness of feelings, wide range of feelings, needed of feelings, appropriate feelings, our feeling self, our psychological self. I feel that for amnesty, this whole area. In the Disney film Inside Out, this is seen when joy and sadness got zooped away. Then anger was at the console. Anger is your activity um, that the person, that joy and sadness got zooped away. So joy and sadness got zooped away, okay? Because the, the person's needs for attachment didn't get met. So when the needs didn't get met, joy and sadness got zooped away, then the anger. So again, Anita Horner had that quote about the pillow uh, issue. She said in the 70s, people went to these self-help groups and all this. It's an Esther something, one of those uh, famous companies or something. Or they'd go to a, oh yeah, what's that one again? And uh, uh, oh yeah, the famous, uh, There's a famous place, uh, Big, Big Sur, is that right? Big Sur, S-U-R. What's that called? Omega? No, not Omega. Oh, there's some kind of famous... Uh, I looked into it once myself, actually. I didn't go there. There was a fa There's a famous uh, like self-help kind of place. Uh. Okay, never mind. Um, so in the 70s, it was popular. There were all these self-help 
gurus and self-help clubs and workshops and seminars and all this. And a common thing they would do is, the, 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 many of them are charlatans, want to make money, right? Um, and um, so they say, oh, okay, well, they'll sort of give you little tricks and games. And, okay, beat the pillow, that's your nonsense. Getting in touch with your anger, that's not really the issue. The issue is understanding why are you angry? Why are you beating the pillow? Like, why would you, like, what is, go underneath, shall I compare thee to an onion? You gotta layer the onion. So the anger is the reactivity that joy and sadness got zooped away. So why did joy and sadness got zooped away? Those are feelings, okay? Under the feelings are needs, okay? Needs and feelings are linked. So the baby had a need for his identity. For his identity, his existentialism, his identity. He had these needs, okay? Needs for reverie, attunement, safety with the mother, interaction with the mother. The mother should soothe the baby, see the baby, accept the baby. Basic sort of needs like that, right? Those needs, so that's called a secure attachment style. The baby had a need for security, secure attachment style. When those, oh, just some stuff, okay. When the guests start coming and I'll move away. Technically, I'm a guest of the restaurant. Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 there's a restaurant here. I bought a coffee, see, I got some tech, but I don't want to push my luck. They, yeah, they, 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 it takes me a while to get to this place, so. Okay, sorry. Uh, oh yeah, let me do my disclaimer. I have been analyzed. I, I haven't been analyzed. If I had the funds, I'd be on the next flight. I'd be on the next flight. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'd find someone like uh, Aletha Horner. Unfortunately, she passed away a decade ago or something. Uh, she would have been a great shrink. Oh my God, I read her book. Oh, awesome, she's awesome. We did some quotes from her. Uh, not Aletha, I keep saying Aletha. Althea, pardon me, Althea Horner. Althea Horner. We've done some excellent quotes of hers recently. I don't know if James Grostein's alive, yeah, I'd see him. Or uh, if Thomas Ogden's alive, I'd see him, yeah. Jeez. Maybe this one here, Bagnini. Today's quotes from Bagnini, me, I'd see him, maybe. See from Italy, I think. Bagnini. If I had the funds, well, if Bagnini's from Italy, I'd fly to Milan or wherever he is. I'd do the analytic process. Oh my goodness. Uh, and 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 um, and face uh, weave a basket. Okay. Uh, lend secondary mentation to the primary issue. That's like a bridge. So when, when we make the unconscious conscious, Hermes flies across. When Hermes flies across, that means the messaging from him that we're accepting something about ourselves that was repressed. So it's coming into the self. That's Hermes flying across. Okay, in repression, uh, so more, more, of the self, oops, more of the self is coming to us, right? I'll try not to get anybody in the camera. Um, yeah, occasionally it happens by accident. Um, maybe I'll move in a minute, yeah. Actually, what am I just? Um, I'm yeah, I'm surprised people haven't come out yet. Look at that, eh? Well, today's a weekday. Yeah, it's what is it? A Thursday? Or something? Thursday, two o'clock, something like that. Um, oh, they had their lunch buffet. Maybe they're sleeping, huh? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's the, what's that place again? Is that the, oh no. So there's a rooftop there, eh? There's a place near here with an upscale rooftop lounge. You got, need reservations, long lineups, very pricey. Oh my god. I just took a peek at it for like 10 seconds. But yeah, it's an impressive 360 view of the whole city kind of thing. Okay, so once again, I'm, I only have a BA. I'm not a counselor, I'm not a social worker, I'm not a midwife, doula, nutritionist, shrink. Um, these kinds of things. Um, so I just, ha I'm the compiler of the quotes, keep that in mind. Uh, keep Robert Bly's advice in mind. When he speaks to an audience, he says to the audience members, dear audience members, 
thank you so much for coming out here tonight in the snow and the blizzard. He's from Minnesota, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to see you all. I'm glad you can make it here. 30% of what you're going to hear tonight is wrong. It's up to you to figure out which 30%. I can't quite imitate it, huh? So likewise, each person has to each person has to be their own psychological detective. Each person needs to kind of take it upon themselves to consider some quotes, write it down, put it aside, let it incubate, see if it can stimulate, like the free associate from, is it a stepping stone for a better idea? Can you eliminate it? You know, and then maybe leads you to a closer idea. Uh, you know, so uh, in each, um, in each video, so one example based on what Robert Bly said to the audience, he said, Dear audience members, read psychology, the study of the soul, psychology, study of the soul, every day for 10 minutes. Forgive it for its jargon. Please, dear audience, please, please forgive psychology for its jargon. Just forgive it, please. He's just trying to encourage that. Come on, be realistic here. Um, the jargon's not perfect. Um, just tolerate it the best you can kind of thing. Uh, put it aside. Um, so in each video here in this channel there's roughly 10 minutes worth of quotes right like this something like that right um, on average there's about 10 10 quotes per video um, now I've done uh, as best as I can as mentioned before as best I can recognize them to be they fit Grice's criteria for communication okay relevance quality manner quantity quantity quality relevance manner so they're clear they're friendly um, there's no Freud, okay, because of the translation problem. No Jung and Lacan, because of this unnecessary, convoluted, made-up jargon that just confuses people. Uh, maybe it's them saying when they were a baby they were confused if they want to confuse you. you know, with the Adlers and the Kohats, a lot of the other big names, they don't really have it. This is practical, uh, helpful, uh, educational material that teaches this psychoanalytic perspective, right? Like our first one here uh, from Bagnini. Right? We use the language of relevance between the here and now repetitions to tap into each partner's unconscious history. So identify the script, identify this template. Okay. So when one shrink said, you know, these to, to the client, you know, dear client, these problems you're telling you're telling me about, we may say that this is what your script is doing to you. Let us as a team. Let us as a team, like lab mates, see what we can do with that script. You know? So we got to recognize this script. Is the self-concept blurred in with the other concept? That's unresolved fusion. That, that'll lead to very intense um, so-called pre oedipal issue of all or nothing thinking. Okay? For the baby, the breast mother is everything. The world, you're my first, you're my last, my everything, sings Barry White. Right? So that kind of thing. A lot of love songs might be in that area. So for, now, if that's not there, um, when, the, when the baby's nursing and everything's blissful in paradise, he's in heaven. That's great. He's got everything. Again, the mother's, breast mothers are bountiful, reliable, safe, beautiful, etc. Right? If the mother's doing it wrong, the baby's enraged and then projects his fantasies of, uh, of rage and unmet greed onto the mother. So the baby's enraged and has oral greed now, puts it onto the mother as a compromise. Oh, the mother's a hungry wolf that wants to eat me. That's the hell image, right? So heaven and hell, baby splits the image of the mother into the hell experience and heaven experience. Right? Baby, because the baby can't uh, tolerate the mother hurting him, mis ignoring his needs and feelings, he's enraged and creates a wild image of the mother. Then he says, okay, that's not my mother. That, that can't be my mother. No way, no way on earth can that be my mother. Impossible. So he, he uh, kind of does a trick of the mind where he just hallucinates on top, like a flip thing. He hallucinates, denies it, hallucinates the goddess, like the guy in the desert, hallucinates an oasis. Oh, there's my mother. Mother's doing her wrong. No, that's a monster. That's not my mother. He's got the splitting going on in his mind already. So if that's, if that, in the intrapsychic world, if splitting is still being used, you see, uh, we need to, that, that'll reveal itself later on. It'll be communicated with all or nothing thinking, everything perfect or forget him, idealized, devalued, 
is either or generally either it's usually extremist it's um, over the top perfect or over the top devalued okay um, so we look at this kind of thing right now splitting if that's going on that's important to recognize splitting if the person can't see the third side of the coin if they can't handle any kind of ambivalence or something um, all right so splitting uh, prevents differentiation that means the child didn't get enough love to separate from the mother the child's got to feel safe with the mother to separate from her but if he's using goddess and demon and there's no mother there he's just dealing with wild images of goddess and demon he doesn't have a positive human interaction to memory he doesn't have a memory of relating to a positive good enough mother to feel safe and to differentiate to have a self-concept he's still blurred in with the oneness and it's either or so he's got a self-concept fused with the goddess uh, image split off with another self-concept fused with the demon image uh, and they're separate and he, and he flips it around like that so that's why some people you know um, have these either or kind of extreme thoughts kind of thing right Miriam Winterbull from San Paulo Brazil gave the example uh, it's on YouTube I played it here about a month ago she quoted her client when she said the client said to her you know when I'm dating this fellow if he doesn't give me everything he gives me nothing I thought that was a very clear demonstration of the splitting mechanism right? so in the psychic in the psychic template the fusion is still there that woman that client didn't feel enough safety um, to resolve the splitting it's called the depressive position uh, meaning you see the third side of the coin you know what in the next video coming up yeah uh, 27 uh, 2717 we've got a very good quote about uh, Melanie Klein's theory about the positions in the beginning the baby may briefly temporarily use the splitting thing um, it's just for a few weeks mother's good enough time passes he gets the experience of mother being more loving and frustrating oh okay mother's one person oh she he can handle he can handle the overall gestalt that the mother's loving a little bit frustrating loves the mother doesn't like that sometimes she did it wrong but still loves the mother but but recognizes the pain with her he can handle that kind of ambivalence that setup allows them to differentiate and um and then he develops in this process so splitting is going to prevent all that so if the, so the inference is if a person in their interpersonal relating has either or extreme that means in the psychic uh, mind memory system okay that when the baby was nursing uh it, it was too erratic it was too painful it was too sh it was more shaming than loving if it's more shaming than loving the baby copes with splitting and doesn't separate the baby can't separate if he's not loved right so we got it we need this kind of a uh, concept of having some kind of um, uh, visualization or something of the intrapsychic world. The interpersonal leads to the intrapsychic world, and this intrapsychic world reveals itself, expresses itself interpersonally later on. So, in, if in the intrapsychic world there's unmet symbiosis, um, you may have a lot of like. Um, um, the person may have like extreme wishes for fusion with somebody that's the that's the romantic love area right the, the narcissistic oneness the blissful the, just the two of us being one so that that kind of, that might come from there right okay um yeah, that's a huge topic about object relations theory and um, there's a thing called relational units um, there's there's the idea that um, the rejecting mother is sometimes split um, into enticing and then rejecting. Yeah, so the, sometimes when well, the mother's disappointing, first she was promising, then rejecting. So the so the the bad mother is split into the the enticing mother, then the rejecting mother. Actually, we have one on this coming up. Let's see, yeah, here it is. Fairbairn's idea of the exciting object. Fairbairn's idea of the exciting object i.e. A, libidin a libidinal tie, life force connection that involves a forever fantasy of repairing the broken promise of an infant parent merger of an infant parent merger the baby needed a merging with the mother okay? for the first four to five months psychologically the baby still won with the mother he needed that if he didn't get that you see then the mother that rejected it 
the baby splits that rejecting mother into the promising she was supposed to offer it there's the hope for it but she rejected it so so the the bad mother the bad breast image is sub split into the exciting and rejecting and usually it's usually it's together um, if something's too too good to be true yeah you're gonna get the riches okay? if you're repeating this great romantic fantasy of bliss there's gonna be a rejection because you're repeating it See, when you repeat something in the present, you're knowing the model, you're knowing the template. We want to up, we want to heal this template. We got to recognize and make it conscious. Then the life force uh, can come into the present. Oh, hold on a second. Okay, we got some guests here. Let me um, let me move over to the other side here. Hold on a second. Oh yeah, there's that fancy uh, rooftop place I was mentioning. Yeah. Nice little spot here, yeah. You can see why I take my time to get here. This is like the nicest little spot. Let's hang out here, yeah, let's, let's hang out here. Sir. Uh, let me get a chair. Hold on a second. Still there? Yeah. Interpersonal leads to the intrapsychic, which expresses itself interpersonally. If the intrapsychic is based on, or represents, or is created by attachment trauma, relational trauma, and insecure attachment style, this convoluted issue, it's going to be in the memory system. This memory system is going to express itself later on with the hope that by doing so, it can repeat, recreate that past with the mother. And maybe the mother will do it differently. Maybe they can change the past, undo the past, track the past. Because the baby's in a state of timelessness. There's no time there. So that's why, that's why it's a repetition compulsion. He has this compulsion uh, to get mother's love, to get his needs met. But it's split. His emotionality is in the past, but there is time. He transfers the emotionality into the present, but the emotionality thinks it's still back then. That, that's why we're not making sense. That's why there's so much confusion. You see? So, I like... Um, I'm still using Berger's metaphor. I think it's still the best metaphor for this. Okay. One of those 45 disc records. Yeah. Imagine a song on there, or a memory of an interaction. Let's call it a tune. Baby cried for love. Mother said no. Baby was shamed by the shaming mother. Okay, that's a trauma, repetition, compulsion. New situation. He's going to replay that record. He's going to play that record. He wants to recreate what caused that problematic record with the hope to get a proper record. The proper record would be, the, in normal development, it's I'm okay, you're okay. You know, if someone says I'm okay, that only works if you say you're okay. The normal development is I'm okay, you're okay, right? Okay, 
this uh, sorry. This, this is the chair that keeps bouncing on me. Oh, Maybe I should cool off. Maybe I should go in and cool off. See, I've only got two hours, right? Maybe, um, I think I need to cool off. Let, let me go to where the AC is. It takes me five minutes to get there. Let me cool off and I'll come back and finish the video, yeah? It doesn't look too good if you see sweat dripping down me, right? It doesn't look too... It doesn't look too... You're already dealing with my anxiety, my speaking anxiety. Uh, so I'm trying to minimize uh, the distractions here. Don't judge this material by yours truly. Like, as mentioned before, I haven't been analyzed. Oh my God, if I could do the analysis and feel more confident and centered, more embodied and be more resonant in a natural way, not in an aggressive way, right? Not to try to hypnotic, uh, booming, uh, frightening or controlling, not, not like in a normal, like being embodied way, right? Uh, then maybe my delivery um, um, can do the quotes a little bit more justice. So yeah, I don't know how to say this. Yeah, just just read it for yourself and decide for yourself. If you read ten quotes, uh, I'm confident one will click, and then you'll okay. Now you're on. Now you're now you're going. But now you're. Uh, getting somewhere right now you're healing now you're on the path to healing because if you get a little click you recognize something that means more of the emotional life force investment into the past can come into the present that's the Hermes flying across you get more in the present okay the record so the record is Baby was shamed by the mother. Two characters on the record. Baby and the mother. Two people. Baby was shamed by the mother. In the new situation, in the new situation, new place, new interaction, new conversation, new job, new relationship. What in the new situation? There's a record. In the new situation, you're gonna recreate, relive, orchestrate like at a psychodrama theater thing, transfer the past into the present and act the whole thing. It's called transference acting out. You're like an actor, co-actor, you're gonna act it out. So in the present, there are two ways that painful interaction can be reenacted in the present. The more painful way is called identification with the aggressor, negative magic gesture. Identification with the aggressor, negative magic gesture. The sting of personality patterns. If the baby's traumatized before 18 months, 18 months is a developmental milestone where he loses the original egocentricity. If the baby's traumatized before 18 months, it's too painful um, to directly replay that. He's too young, too tender, shamed so much by the mother. Uh, so when he replays that record, the record says mother shamed him. Okay. He's going to play the shaming mother now. That's called identification with the aggressor. He can't play himself anymore. He can't feel himself anymore. Okay, that's too repressed. His unloved self is so repressed. As mentioned before, when something's repressed, it's projected. So he's gonna project his sense that he's flawed, shamed, no good, defective, and all this outwardly onto someone else. He'll see himself onto outwardly to not know that it's within. So when he replays the record of mother shaming him, He's going to play the mother who shames him, but he already sees himself onto non-threatening substitute others. So he's going to shame others, thinking he's shaming himself. Okay, the loyalty is, he's loyal to the mother who shames him. Okay? So, he's, so with identification with the aggressor, the baby has to have a mother. So he'll imitate the mother to that end. Right? The new situation is mother shamed him. He plays the shaming mother who shames himself, but he already rejected his soul, so to speak. And it's repressed, denied, and he sees that onto non-threatening substitute others. Safe, innocent, however the other people are considered safe, 
he'll see it onto them. He's got to find someone uh, to, to project his unloved self onto. Because the loyalty is to the mother who shames him. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to feel mother shaming him. But he's going to shame himself. Okay? But he, to trick him, to, he's going to recreate and relive that. But the trick is, he'll see himself onto others. And then when he shames others, it distracts him from the memory of mother shaming him. That's called the stinger personality patterns. It's a negative magic gesture, identification with the aggressor, not making sense. Really, shaming others to replay how the mother shamed them is going to change what happened in the past? It's nonsense. We're not making sense, right? But the repetition compulsion is to replay what happened. But when the stinger personality patterns, again, all of the personality patterns that developed prior to 18 months are called the stinger personality patterns, as discussed in recent videos. Okay, the bully pattern, the agua pattern, narcissistic pattern, all those difficult, right? So, in the new situation, they've identified with the mother. Okay? To have a mother, they got to imitate her. An ongoing attempt to save her, heal her, correct her. Okay, so let's back up a sec. When the baby wants mother's love, and mother's not offering it, the baby may interpret mother's hate. Okay? So, love love or hate, right? The mother's offering love. If the mother's love is not there, the mother's hate is there. So the, mother, the baby's getting mother's hate. The baby may interpret mother's hate as the mother crying for love. Oh, ouch, mother, you're not loving me. Oh, you're crying for love, are you? I'll save you. I'll correct you. I'll heal you. You need a oneness. You need, you need emerging and symbiosis. Well, well, we're one already. I'll, I'll, um, we'll, we'll be like glue. We'll be like crazy glue. And you know what? I'll just imitate you all the time until you feel seen. Now, at the same time, the baby has to have some connection to the mother. So imitating her is that ongoing attempt uh, to maintain the attachment. But imitating her is the ongoing attempt to try to save her. So he's loyal to her while trying to save her because ultimately he needs mother to love him. So he's going to try to save her and be loyal to her. That's his, that's his attachment to her, the effort to save her and be loyal to her. Now, at the same time, the reality is, the baby's going to treat himself the way his mother treated him. Okay? That's the inner critic. So if later on he tries to get out of this um, complex, mother complex, the memory comes up that says, hey, did you save the mother? No, you didn't. That's the inner critic. The inner critic, or the superego, or the unconscious conscience, or the unconscious conscious, conscious um, reminds, the per reminds the person of their own false belief. Hey, baby, you had a belief that it was your job to save the mother. Remember that? Did you? No, you didn't. So the inner critic is considered impossible to please. Okay? It's no baby's job to save the mother. But the baby has magical thinking, omnipotence of thought, unconditional hallucinatory omnipotence. In the uterus, he thinks it's all him. He's the center of the universe. He makes everything happen. It's all about him. He creates everything. Everything's for him. Little king, little god, magic sorcerer. Parad when he's born, he needs paradise to continue. Paradise is not there. Okay, just fix the mother to get his paradise. So he's still in that mode of trying to fix the mother to get his paradise. So to fix the mother to get his paradise, he's got to uh, mirror her and be like her in the attempt with the belief that the mother wanted oneness with her mother. So the baby will play her mother. The baby's trying to be a good mother for the mother, in effect. It's not going to work, but he's stuck there, waiting for mother to f say, thank you, baby, for loving me, and now I can know myself and love you. It's not going to work, right? No baby, it's no baby's job to save the mother, cure the mother, heal the mother. So for more on this point, Morton Key sent 2291 and 2 in our collection, 2291 and 2. Okay, so, so back, to, back, to the, um, back to the sting of personality patterns. The baby thinks he's a little god in the uterus, right? Solipsism, hollow mirrors, all about him. Okay. When he's born and his paradise is not met, he may think, oh, I'm everything, I'm the universe, uh, and I'm in pain, my paradise is not there, am I defective, am I a flawed god or something? Is the uni like, he'll may, he may just conclude simply like that. Part B, baby can't undifferentiation. The baby can't differentiate or parse out where he begins and ends and where the mother begins and ends. So if the mother's quote-unquote defective, he thinks he's defective. Okay, part C, as just mentioned, he can't save the mother. He'll try to save the mother, he can't save the mother. You have those three points that the child concludes with, I'm not okay. Insult to injury, he's got to lie to himself, say the mother is okay, to, to feel safe enough in the hallucination that the mother's safe enough so he can feed. 
so that's like unconscious guilt. Uh, so there's a whole thread on that one. Um, so you layer those four points up. The baby concludes with, I'm not okay. okay. Mother must be okay. You put a dash between the M and the O in the word mother. The M is the intrapsychic, which expresses itself interpersonally, which is the other. So other's okay. I'm not okay, other, you're okay. So the child, all babies begin with, I'm not okay, you're okay. But for the sting of personality patterns, if the mother is really constantly misattuned, the strain, they call it a strain, again and again, micro misattuned, malattuned, my bottle schedule, mother is not emotionally available, mother not around, mother doesn't, mother using the baby, again, the baby is so pained by this. Okay. He can't go through the developmental process. So his humanness, his sense of I'm not okay, his human I'm not okayness, he can't take it anymore. He projects it outwardly. Okay? He'll revert, he'll regress back to the old false belief that he had in the uterus that he was a little god. He'll take refuge in that. Okay, that's the search for the uh, the search for glory. The th uh, Paris, uh, Jeanette Paris calls it the search for the, the high chair throne. He's a little god, little king and all this. Okay, the idealized self, the glorified self, the ego ideal, okay, the narcissism, infantile megalomania. He's going to search for this constant illusionary belief that he was a little god, right? And it's addictive because in that place you're one with the mother. Okay, so the baby one with the mother is in a naturally blissful state. He's not addicted or something. But later on, when you're always searching for that and you're getting the brain thing, um, that's why narcissism is named after that flower. It gives people an illusionary kind of effect. Because the symbiosis has a blissful kind of uh, oneness feeling. Oh, one second. I think I, there's some, oh, there's some stuff right there. Uh-oh. Hold on a second. Let me make sure I'm not bothering anybody. Wow. Just, just to be on the safe side, let, let me cool off. Uh... Okay, let me um. Let's do this. Huh? Okay. That looks like a. That looks like a manager talking to a staff or something. Maybe having a private. That guy's still there. Oh, they're still there. Okay. okay let, let's uh, let, let, let's pull off a bit here. Hold on a second. Light here. The fourth floor has a has a meeting. Okay, it was there. The fitness, the fitness and the offices are there. I'm a little limited to where I can speak or I don't you know, disturb anybody, get anybody's weight kind of thing. I figure if I'm very careful and not you know, interrupt anybody, they might put up with me. <laughs> Until the couple is helped to recognize and deal with the unconscious aspects of human experience that follow them into the current relationship, marital and self-satisfaction will be compromised. Okay, let's just go out of the AC place. Yeah, there's a... There's a... Like a... Like a, an accompanying building near here. 
They've got very good AC there. So let's let's go there. Yeah. Right. As partners repeat emotionally overwhelming difficulties of deficient nurturing, and as trauma replays itself and is automatically ascribed to the other person's indifference or demanding ways. Yeah, so you're blaming. So you're blaming the partner. Huh? I'll put over here. AC here. Oh, look at that, eh? 17, all right. Oh, it's like taking a nice cold shower in right here. Let's get one of these chairs here for a second. Let's do that, let's do that. Uh, I'm not sure if you're seeing it, how well you're seeing it, but uh, if you click the more link, you'll see it below there. How about this? Is that better? Well. Until the couple is helped to recognize and deal with the unconscious aspects of human experience that followed them, it followed them, right? Burglar reminds me of one of Edmund Burglar, one of our mentors. He has a quote about relationships. He says, uh, he said to a, I guess it was a guy or something. Do you really think that leaving your mate is is, is going to solve your problems? Your inner conflicts will faithfully follow you into the next relationship. Heal your inner conflicts and save your relationship. If you think leaving your partner means you're going to leave your inner complex nonsense. Your inner complex will faithfully follow you into the next relationship. So heal the inner complex and save your relationship. This book that comes from a book entitled Divorce Won't Help. Okay. Yeah, same idea, right? Until the couple is helped to recognize and deal with the unconscious aspects of human experience that follow them into the current relationship, Marital and self-satisfaction will be compromised as partners repeat emotionally overwhelming difficulties of deficient nurturing and as trauma replays itself and is automatically ascribed to the other person's indifference or demanding ways. See, now you're blaming the person for what the mother did. Okay, let's back up. Let's finish up with the, the way um, the reenactment, the two ways the reenactment takes place, the stinger and the clinger way. So the stinger way means, um, so all babies begin with, I'm not okay, you're okay, right? Again, if the mother's doing it again and again, at some point, before 18 months, if it's like that, he says, he gives it up. He gives up his soul, so to speak. And others can have it. He has the pain, but he'll fantasize that others can have it. But he has it. It's just a trick to not know it. So he says others are no good. Okay, he reverts to the regressed infantile place that is a little god and searches for that. That's the search for glory that Karen Hornet talks about, one of our mentors. Okay, like, like the way Pierre Gins and Don Juans and Playboys and all these egotistical, uh, angry, uh, vindictive uh, types, right? That, that's the search for the glory, the, the infantile megalomania. 
cynicism, God of Pfizer, Shadow of Florida, God of Pfizer, grievance collecting, injustice collecting, okay, hate, greed, envy, grand be, spite, vindictiveness. It's a pretty negative, uh, and uh, um, no, matter how, no matter how convincing they can use their 10 PhDs to um, create what's called a rationalization. I mean, I want to brainwash you to believe that I'm being reasonable. It's just a mask to hide the deeper uh, embarrassing issue. Rationalization is a major threat. It's an important topic as well. Okay, so shall I compare thee to an onion? Burglar says, first confront the rationalizations. And then you're going down or down, right? So um, when the stingers put out their uh, humanness onto others, they felt no good by the mother. They'll say others are no good. That tricks them for not feeling how they feel no good. In the new situation, the record says mother shamed them. Oh, new situation, they'll pay the shaming mother. That's their ongoing attempt to save the mother, be loyal to the mother, have a mother, or have some dream of a possible mother. The, the connection to the mother is the fantasy of having a mother. So they're imitating or trying to save her. They don't even really have a good mother. In this and fairy tales, there is no good mother, usually, right? So, um, he, he's uh, going to play the shitty mother. That's, his, that's, that's as close as he can get to having a mother, imitating her. But what, does he do? what did the mother do? The mother shamed him. So to be loyal to the mother, he's got to shame himself. Again, too painful. He saw himself onto others. So as he's shaming himself, the trick of the mind, he sees himself onto the non-threatening substitute other. So there's your prejudice. Right? They'll find some safe, non-threatening substitute other. Okay? They could be disadvantaged, uh, could be in a difficult situation, but they're safe. So, okay, then, or they're seen as defective, or, I mean, they're, they're seen as wounded, because you were wounded, right? So, well, however the other is seen as safe, you know, make it up. You have to make it, they have to make it up. It's a compulsion to, to be, to have the, remember life force is object seeking? Okay, all of the child's energies to have the connection to the mother? So it's, that's the compulsion. The, the baby must bond to the mother. The baby must connect to the mother. That's the compulsion. So they have this compulsion uh, to search for that mother. So they got to see themselves outwardly. That's why uh, hate and prejudice is like this compulsive, demanding quality to it. And they, they, don't, they can't help themselves, they say. The baby can't help himself. The baby has to look for the breast mother and latch on. He, he's looking for that. It's an innate biological kind of drive or something or whatever it's called. Um, uh, so, in the new situation, he plays a shaming mother. The record says mother shamed him, but he already sees, just as just mentioned, he already sees himself onto others. So, he's shaming others, thinking he's shaming himself, thinking he's replaying the record, being loyal to the record, and mother shaming him. Doesn't make sense. Non-threatening substitute others are not him. He doesn't care. He'll cloak it over, he'll make some excuse. He'll use his knowledge or whatever, fabricate some excuse, make it up, lie, and believe it. He's got to believe it. He's got to believe it. Because if he, if he confronts that lie, he's got to face the painful truth that the memory his mother hurt him. But he's become the mother. So he, did, he didn't get enough love from her to leave her. So to admit all of this, it leads to what they call the furies, abandonment, depression, the persecutory anxiety, the, the terrible feelings the baby felt with the mother back then, it's repressed. So the lies and the lies cloak it all to not feel that pain with the mother. So in, in, the, in the repetition compulsion, um, they, they go through life imitating the shaming mother who shames them, but they already see themselves onto others, so they're shaming others. So they shame others to replay how the mother shamed them, thinking that they're replaying the record. The record was that they cried for love for the mother, but they can't play themselves. They play the shaming mother. That's why it's so distorted and twisted and perverse and psychotic and deluded. It's just so twisted in there. Alice in Wonderland kind of thing, right? It's a different mad kind of thing in there in the non-reporting brain and very early on. No time, displacement, double think, trans logic. It's all toxic turvy and, right? So. Now, if the child can hold on to his soul, 
if he was able to get enough love, so to speak, to maintain the original identity of I'm not okay, you're okay. If the child can still hold on to I'm not okay, you're okay, if he can still hold on to that somehow post 18 months when the grandiosity dissipates, but he's frozen between 18 months and 36 months and he's stuck with that childlike, infantile, I'm no good, you're good. Okay, those are the clingers, the pleasers, the caretakers, okay, preoccupied, always want, always think others are so amazing, they're no good. So they're maintaining that kind of a hope for the good parent. They're, they're still in that place, if I'm not okay, you're okay. But the students have given up on it. It's too painful to stay on emotional, that emotional path. They gave up on it. Okay? They say, others can have their humanness. They'll play infantile God, and they'll reject uh, feeling, sensitivity, the feminine principle. The what's that? problem with this spot is uh, right beside, I'm right beside all the smokers, so I'm kind of really distracted. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's do this way. Okay, let's do this way. Um, so um, the clingers are more childlike, they're more emotional, they're histrionic or something. Um, but the, the clingers, have, they're halfway there. Love, gratitude, reparation, uh, it's, they're sort of halfway there. The search for narcissistic glory that their little infantile God has dissipated. Now hang on a sec. There's a confusion here. The codependents and the clingers are not the same as the clinging vine narcissists. So this is the point Fritz Kunkel, Johnny Sanford's mentor, talks about. Distinctive personality patterns include the narcissistic patterns, as well as the Iago and the bully and all the other patterns. Right? But the narcissistic pattern takes various branches off. Okay, the, the cookie cutter familiar one that, we're, that we're, we always talk about, right? the star one, let's say. But there's a version of the narcissistic pattern called the turtle narcissistic pattern. In other words, called the clinging vine narcissistic pattern, right? Now, Kunkel's uh, neuro narcissistic pattern, he's talking about the bully pattern. But the clinging vine narcissistic pattern, you see, the psychic structures, they believe they're okay and others are not okay. That's different from the codependent. The codependent says, I'm not okay, you're okay. The codependent has got more heart and love and care and they're trying to save others. The clinging vine narcissists, they're not trying to, they're still, they're still hurting others. They're just proud that, uh, to get away with not having to grow up or something. They have this fiery uh, victory area. So there's a difference between the clinging vine narcissistic pattern and the codependent, you see? The clinging vine narcissistic pattern is not helpful to others, doesn't care about others. They, they have the same sort of setup of uh, hate, greed, envy, envy, spite, vindictiveness, shadow fire. Okay. So for the clingy vine and the turtle and the star and all that, I mean the cookie cutter uh, narcissistic pattern, right? Exploits others, doesn't care about others, looking out for number one. The sting of personality patterns have slogans such as, what's my greed or your greed? Remember when the baby was nursing? He was enraged and, uh, and his unmet need became oral greed and he projected those psychological elements onto the mother image and creates the mother image of, as a monster that wants to devour him or a hungry wolf that wants to gobble him up or like a cyclops monster in the Odyssey that eats the people okay, and Hansel and Gretel, the witch, witch wants to eat the people okay, when the baby creates an image of his mother like that that image, is, the mother's not like that but he creates an image of like that to deal with, to, to be able to deny he, the, the excitation around his rage and oral greed Remember projection, he can't face that, so he projects it. And it creates the image as a result. So it comes at a huge cost. So Then he identifies with the aggressor and acts greedy. So one of his slogans of life, well, if I'm not greedy, then my mother will eat me. Either be eaten, my greedy or greed. What a traumatized mindset. That's the perverse logic, uh, trauma, trauma, brain trauma imagery logic early on. Babies shouldn't be traumatized so early on. Oh my God. Babies are traumatized, they're frozen with these wild uh, image, violent images in their brain or something, right? Okay. I'm starting to cool off here. Maybe I can go back. Yeah. No, no, there's a guy up there, yeah. Just bust him, bust him. But he's a lucky guy, I just got the whole pool to himself. Yeah.
Okay, I've talked a lot about the stinger personality patterns in previous videos. Um, so, they don't want feedback, they don't trust. Okay, all of the machismo, all of the toxic masculinity attitudes, they hate vulnerability, they hate feelings, they hate trust, they don't, okay. Because once upon a time as a baby, they, they were in that place, so look what happened. They identified with the aggressor, and to stay loyal to the mother, they gotta treat others the way the mother treated him. So, uh, one of their songs is Get Over It, right? So in that, in that annoying song, um, it's about a guy, like in the song, the, the protagonist in the song, maybe was saying that when he was a baby, he was crying and crying. Mother said, stop, what do you want, baby? Get over it, get over it, stop crying. I don't know what you need, you're, you make me uncomfortable. Your crying makes me anxious, stop it, stop it. So he identifies with the aggressor. Yep. The protagonist in that song is saying, anybody out there who has feelings and needs, get over it, get over it, get over it. So that song is about identification with the aggressor, saying to others what the mother said to them. Okay. So in the toxic masculinity, I think it's similar. Oh, get over it. Oh, don't, don't, be a, don't, don't complain or something, right? Now, complaining, by the way, uh, says, uh, was it Gilbertson, yeah, Tina Gilbertson. Is that right? She said, um, shall I compare thee to an onion? The, the deep belief is that the person is afraid that it's okay to have something better in their life. So they're complaining. The recognition of that, maybe they can stop complaining, right? But if they're... Okay. So you sort of get the idea of the frustration of people complaining um, because uh, they're saying they want something better and the listener doesn't know that, right? So you're putting the listener in a position of trying to help them have something better for the past. So that's why they're frustrated or something. So that's why we need some consciousness around this area, right? So the, the understanding on both sides they both understand each other and calm down kind of thing, right? So this is the cry for love, right? So everything's love or a cry for love. That's the bottom line. Right? Everything's love or a cry for love, like Ms. Shulman says. I have this fantasy that 1001 Women's the Mind resembles Helen Shulman's book. She's got this thick uh, blue book called The Course of Miracles. The very thin, high quality, uh, thin pages like a very, like a, like a, almost like a, it's like the, the grain is very fine or something. It's a very, uh, like a good, good quality paper and the printing is very clear. And uh, it's a thick uh, blue book, I don't know, thousand, thousand pages plus in there, right? Um, so 1001 Wins of the Mind can fill that. And I think it's, thousand times more, I think it's 10,000 times more helpful than that uh, OCD book. Although she did say a couple of useful things, right? Love or cry for love. Um, the line that I most remember is, you're never angry for the reason you think. People are angry because joy and sadness got zooped away. Why did joy and sadness get zooped away? Because the underlying needs for a secure attachment wasn't met. That's why they're anger. Anger means you didn't get the secure attachment stuff. A lot of people don't know that, so they're angry and they, well, I'm angry because you, you're a mistreating heart, you, you're a liar, don't be so cruel. So you're blaming the person in the present, but the mother did. That's what she means. You're not angry for the reason that you think. Blaming the partner for what the mother did, see, that, that's not true. The partner in the present doesn't cause the pain that the mother caused in the nursery. That's, I think that's the, sort of the source point of it all, right? Okay, I, there's a whole body of material about the string of personality patterns and a whole thread of material about each of the personality patterns. Okay, Iago, bully pattern, different narcissistic patterns, lower functioning BPD, and a little bit more in that, in that area. Right? So that's the whole body of material. Um, but, uh, but the basic thing is they shame others in the present to replay how the mother shamed them ultimately for them to observe their behavior to know how their mother treated them. So if they can recognize that what they're doing is a compulsion from the unconscious self to the conscious self. Hey you, I'm showing you how you were treated. I'm getting you to treat others so you can know how you were treated. So if a person can observe that kind of thing, okay, there's a, there, there's a turning point. 
there can be a huge relief of understanding of why they're doing this. Make the, and the Hermes flies across with that message, right? Now the Klinger personality patterns, they're not called the stinger. The stinger because they hurt others, right? The Klingers don't hurt others. They just coax others to reject them. Because the record said mother shamed them. In these situations, they just expect others to shame them. So they prod them, goad them, induce them to shame them, reject them. They're not shaming others. They're not hurting others. They're just being a little uh, uncooperative or something, or passive aggressive, or, um, you know, if they have the belief that the person in the presence is going to reject them, and they relate to them with that belief, the, the receiver feels a kind of like a pull or expectation. Finally, it happens, oh, they would play the record. When, so the clingers are doing this for them to know that the mother rejected them. Okay. So clingers go to others to reject them. That's for them to know the mother rejected them. Stingers reject others for them to know that the mother rejected them. So those are the two main ways the reenactment of the record takes place. So that, that's uh, just that's just those. That's just one piece of the puzzle. That's just one piece of the puzzle. You know, um, the repetition compulsion to recreate in the present something that metaphorizes the past, so that you can see your emotions from the past and the present, thinking you're still in the past, thinking you're going to get the love that was needed. Okay. So the fantasy is that when you replay it in the present, you can change the past, get the love that was needed. Unawareness of this, we keep doing it until we become aware. Again, source point, we lost the golden ball. We are repeating to get it back. We repeat because we lost the golden ball. We repeat in search for the golden ball, which we would get with consciousness, weaving the basket. And finally, when we weave the basket, get the golden ball, and we stop repeating and can enjoy the present and love life. If the, gold, if the golden ball's missing, we're not loving life. If the golden ball's missing, oh boy, we're stuck in the past, Dwelling in the past, lingering in the past. Uh, simple, basic, classical conditioning. Okay, enter all those phrases. Life is passing me by, sleepwalking through life, going through the motions in life, feeling unreal, feeling numb, you know, um, feelings uh, that you're living a provisional life, right? Uh, Jeanette Paris calls that freezing emotional hypothermia. You know, and uh, one case, in one case, maybe a guy had prenatal trauma and he had emotional catatonia. So he was really kind of stuck in the past. Right? Funny thing about that character, Maynard Krebs, he was always into music. And uh, somebody said that uh, in prenatal trauma, the music was broken. The natural music that's in the uterus was broken. Right? So he's trying to relink it, he's trying to revive it. So he was obsessed with uh, music, right, that guy. He didn't care about his studies or anything else, he just wanted to play music, right? Because maybe, uh, cause in the baby, the prototype of music in the uterus, heartbeat, mother's heartbeat, pulsating of the cord, and the blood flow leading to some kind of melody, because there's three veins, central one, two, the spiral up. Sorry, just uh, this guy is uh, distracted by the guys. Well, I can go back here. Okay. Yeah, we don't have much information. We don't have a threat on smoking. But jeepers, it would be interesting to uh, learn more about it. Uh, we have one quote about alcoholism, which may be linked to smoking, is that there's more of a demand for the mother. There's more of a demand for the mother. It's like you want it more immediately, you want it now kind of thing. But so we don't have any threads on smoking, yeah. Oh, except for that uh, propaganda one where, they, were, where they, uh, they wanted to sell cigarettes to ladies back in the 50s or something. So they said to the ladies, hey ladies, okay. so the ladies are not conscious of this. So they'll transfer something that they unconsciously want onto the cigarette. So unconsciously, the ladies want emotional freedom from the mother. Oh, yeah. okay, but they don't say that. They just say, hey, this cigarette will give you freedom. It's a torture freedom. It'll give you freedom. 
what really gave me freedom? They're looking for emotional freedom. Really? Giving yourself a damage in your lungs is gonna give you emotional freedom from your mother? It's irrational. But they want they want the hope and the promise of having emotional freedom. The, 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 the woman who didn't get enough love from her mother to know herself is not going to get emotional freedom from her mother in the mind by smoking nicotine or something. Right? Now, the confusing thing is the woman may transfer the mother onto others in the world and then use the smoke and puff smoke and in their direction or uh, if someone's talking to them, they'll reject them by pulling out a cigarette, looking away, I reject you. So, so if they see mother onto everybody, and they use it like a little torch or freedom, right? Like a little tool. Uh, so they, they can use many little little uh, gestures like this, right? Someone's talking, oh, you're my mother, I'm going to reject you. I'm going to pull out a cigarette, oh, excuse me, i got to light up and blow smoke in there. But it's not going to change what happened in the past. Uh, so, let, okay, let's not bother with that one too much. Uh, but... Uh, we do have a few quotes on the psych on, um, psychoanalysis of advertising and all this. Um, you know, they want you to transfer something that's unconscious to the product. So you're buying the product to see if you can meet some kind of unconscious need that you're not aware of. Okay, for bliss, for safety, uh, for narcissism. Okay, at this muffler shop, you're a somebody. You feel important. It could be for grandiosity or for just for a basic identity. You know, or. Uh, if, if the person has a sting of personality pattern, the product might say, yeah, you're going to get even if you have a lot of vindictiveness fantasies. Or if it's for the cling of personality patterns, finally they're going to get the love they were looking for. Okay, let's, let's talk about that. Let's, let's, uh, we'll update this topic on uh, advertising and all this. Okay, another, let's do the first. Let's do the first two again. We use the language. We use the language of relevance between the here and now repetitions to tap into each partner's unconscious history. A here and now interpretive emphasis implies that there had to be a there and then pattern that is continuing to wreak havoc. Yeah. Until the couple is helped to recognize and deal with the unconscious aspects of human experience that follow them into the current relationship, okay, satisfaction will be compromised as partners repeat emotionally overwhelming difficulties of deficient nurturing and as trauma replays itself and is automatically ascribed to the other person's indifference or demanding ways. Okay, so the baby lays down neural pathways, neural circuitry with the mother, but it's a problem, unfinished business, it's stuck, upset. Later on, they choose a partner who has a psychology similar to the mother. You see, the, you see your mother's psychology in the partner. That triggers up the, the wiring with the mother. So the person in the present just is, triggers up the wiring with the mother. Now, now you're in this blissful oneness with the mother, so hence the, the, the great excitement. You're back one with the mother. But this time, the partner is seen as an emotional reincarnation of the mother into the partner. You're transferring, it's called transfer as love. You're transferring the mother into the partner. The partner triggers up the electricity with the mother. So all that neural pathways that was laid down between the baby and the mother uh, flares up. Uh, because the partner reminds you of the mother, so it triggers it all up. One second, another smoke. Okay, I guess I've cooled off here. I've got 30 minutes left here. Okay, let's finish this up uh, by the side there. Okay, let's uh, just turn this chair here. One second.
here. I was in Germany this uh, this time last year. I couldn't believe all the smokers over there. Smoking is huge over there. Vending machines everywhere, smokers everywhere. I couldn't believe it. I was very surprised. Isn't that nice of her? Here's the table. Okay, let's give this a try. It's lighting. Oh, that was nice of her. See, I, you know, I did the videos before by the side there, but uh, she said, um, you know, it's not really, it's not really, uh, I break the the nice uh, setup. <laughs> okay, let's try this uh, setup here. The nice thing is I get to, I get to see the nice uh, cherry blossoms. It's nice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's try this again. Again, until the couple is helped to recognize and deal with the unconscious aspects of human experience that follow them into the current relationship, okay, marital and self-satisfaction will be compromised as partners repeat emotionally overwhelming difficulties of an emotionally available, insufficient maternal experience. And that being a trauma, that trauma replays itself and then is automatically ascribed, assigned to the person in the presence, indifference, right? Don't be cruel, right? Uh, you're mistreating her. Okay, how can you be so cool, right? Your partner's indifference or demanding ways. Let's go, let's go upstairs, let's go outside, yeah. her managerial spirit she, she tried to find some kind of balance and compromise uh, for the hotel needs and for the guest needs so she found that little uh, let's try this out I'll put you put you in the corner with a little table uh, so I liked I liked her kind of exploratory kind of a efforts there. Part of it is, I, I feel like I'm bothering people when I'm talking there, right? So it's part of that. Uh oh. I hear some kids. Let's see. Excuse me, kids. Let's go to the other side. Okay. Oh, this is much better, yeah. Look at that. All right.
these two hour videos they're kind of they're making me rush the material I feel like um, I'm not giving it I'm not doing it justice really underappreciated point yeah so the person in the present has a has a neural wiring like the mother you 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 sense that okay. and and it flares up because the unconscious doesn't understand time so you're back with the mother oh there's mother again all right mother no time oh there's mother so you're excited i love you you're perfect now change please title of a play Now, that partner uh, cannot be the good breast mother that was needed back in the nursery. So, you may have thought she was very exciting and all this, but remember in the past, mother rejected. Exciting, rejecting. So you got the excited, okay, and it's gonna be rejecting. Then, that pain you felt, now, triggered up. That's what you experienced with the mother. Don't blame the partner in the present, right? So. People will say, oh, pardon the present, don't be so cruel. Uh, the song, we, uh, one time the song was playing. Um, in another venue, there was a, a band uh, playing on the ground floor, a cover band doing Don't Be Cruel to a Heart That's True, right? How does it go again? Uh, the Elvis Presley song, right? Yeah, so, no, that person just reminds you of how cruel the mother was. The greatest hurt of all, the greatest hurt of all, the truth will upset you free. Mother failed to provide a secure attachment. That's the greatest hurt of all. Until we get there, until we get there, we're going to keep replaying, recreating until we recognize it. Okay? Then we can stop repeating kind of thing. Oh. Okay, let's do the next one here. Does this work? Let's see, let's try this. Does that work? Well, each partner, okay, each partner may be testing a therapist as a side taker. Okay, so if the couple goes to therapy, um, right, they're gonna find out, is the therapist gonna take sides, right? Each partner may be testing the therapist as a side taker because that would reduce the client's polarized state of mind. Okay? So if, if the therapist, yeah, if the therapist it, it can hold the two sides himself, that's going to help them do the same, right? If the therapist does take sides, well, then the cup, then the therapy's broken usually, right? Because because then it's seen that one client becomes the therapist's favorite. Right? And then we might conjecture a so-called Oedipal victory for one partner and an Oedipal loss for the other, which repeats okay, that kind of dynamic in the family of origins. Okay. In trauma, in trauma, um, this issue of, of not getting mother's love to leave her. That's called the Oedipal complex, or the pre-Oedipal complex. Okay? So this later on is demonstrated that if the therapist is the parent, and one a client quote-unquote wins, or they got the mother, the other lost the mother. That's, that's all that means. Okay. Um, next one here. Quote, who do you suppose this argument represents for the marriage over time? So the couples are having an argument and the, and the therapist said, what do you suppose this uh, argument represents for the marriage over time? Clearly there are differences in how each of you views the same situation. But both are quite frustrated with how needs are addressed being that you each see the same situation differently.
So the positive intention is they're trying to meet their unmet needs from childhood, identify those needs, name those needs. Enter that Rosenberg book, uh, NBC, Language of Life. Okay, that's sort of more in the self-help area. Okay, let's do the next one here. Couples in regression cannot tolerate any kind Oh, sorry, any third, right? Okay, couples in regression cannot tolerate any third in the other partner's life, right? So if the partner has a child, a friend, or a career, or even a therapist, or even other differences, like, whoa, these are experienced as narcissistic wounds in the form of rejection, abandonment, loss of self-esteem, okay? For couples with pre oedipal object relations pathology, the primary dyad is the site of greatest deficit, trauma or neglect. Consequently, marriage is expected to make up for those losses without any recognition of the contributions of past life to current unrealistic demands. So if one person in their relationship has, has um, this like total exclusivity or everything, and they have like outside interests, that, that's a so-called pre oedipal issue, right? So there can be immense envy or jealousy. No, there'll be envy. There might be envy around that, right? No, if the, if the husband and wife have both have a pre oedipal issue, right? I Meaning just the two of them, exclusivity. None of them does anything outside the couple, let's say. One of them does exit with some other interest. The other one that's still in the fusion uh, feels abandoned. So he'll reject um, or deny or be angry of the other partners, whatever it is, career, friendship, child, therapist. The person who's still in the fusion considers it being rejected, abandoned, Okay, this is called the pre oedipal dilemma. So the pre oedipal dilemma is they're still trying to get the good breast experience, the perfect blissful fusion with the mother. If people have that fusional experience, you know, and that's post 18 months, wow. that's, that's a different story. That's the so-called oedipal issue where they're moving forward. But the pre oedipal issue is more regressive. They can't move forward because they didn't get the basic love to do so. So they're stuck in the prior state. So some couple, yeah. So some people are expecting too much, as so-called pre uh, Others that are more reasonable, a little confused, but they're reasonable. That's they can move forward, right? Something like that. I don't really use these terms too much, so let's just keep let's just keep it to the minimum for that one. An adage in couple work is: if you want to understand an individual's personality, look for the company they keep. It's quite amazing, eh? You see someone looks very interesting. Wait a minute. Look at the partner. Oh my god. Let's see. They're not that healthy that you think they are, right? Like if someone looks so uh, successful or something, and you think they're so mature and all that, you look at the partner, it turns out the partner is uh, uh, like a depressed, uh, Lack of confident, uh, lackey or something. Uh, right? That means the first person you were so impressed by isn't that confident to have a normal, equal relationship. They're using the, the victim partner as a secure base for them, as a defense against healthy mutuality. The therapist attempts to open the space for a new experience in which the future is not born of the past. The goal is to locate the couple's unconscious dynamic history that usually repeats the obvious without leading anywhere. When a level of new experience occurs, links, new connections, insights, release the frozen results, or at least explain the frozen results. 
Countertransference awareness can alert the therapist to what the couple feels, fears. So if someone's goading it to feel something, maybe the first person is afraid of what he's trying to get you to feel for him. Uh, conscious longings and conflicts join with unconscious wounded inner child of the past memories. Right? For example, there may be a certain kind of wished for marriage. For example, early romance is usually a veneer for narcissistic merger fantasies. Okay, there can be a spectrum of couple regression to mature relatedness. So is the couple regressed or are they operating more in a mature related way? As a sort of a spectrum. If it's regressed, you know, then they're looking for merger fantasies. They're looking for everything. So the conscious behaviors, longings, link in with the unconscious. That's what he means. And this can this can affect um, the style of the marriage. The hopeful marriage, let's say, uh, sort of the reactive, defensive marriage. Uh, versus the idea that someone should play your double self for you and you play the double self for them and you don't make the links or something. Let's, let's, uh, let's uh, put that one aside as well. Oh, here's that one about uh, Melanie Klein's theory. Okay, here's, the, here's, not a, here's a fairly good quote about Melanie Klein's theory about the positions. So when the baby, when the baby uh, projects his rage and oral greed onto the mother, and that's not his mother, hallucinates a goddess, that's splitting. And the paranoid part is, no, the mother doesn't want to hurt the baby. That's the paranoid schizoid position. It, block, it prevents differentiation. That means he doesn't have his golden ball and his joy. He won't know his interests and have mutuality. He'll have unrealistic, ex he'll have unreal realistic expectations later on. Prejudice will be there. My greed and your greed thinking will be there. Um, they'll have one of the stinger personality patterns. Okay? So mother gave them emotional poverty, plundered their soul, pillaged their soul, short sold their soul. Expl mother abused her power in this way. They identify with the aggressor. Later on, they may express that. Okay. Interpersonal leads to the interest psychic, which then expresses itself through the person interpersonally later on, right? So a lot of the stinger personality, so the stinger personality patterns basically have what's called a paranoid schizoid position. The clinger personality patterns move more into the depressive position, meaning they can hold the two sides. So here's one way of describing it. Okay, in what she called the paranoid schizoid position, Melanie Klein talked about the need to mentally, quote, get rid of bad threatening aspects of the self that are too much to bear. One's own unbearable feelings and thoughts are projected outwardly and thereafter attributed to the other because they cannot be tolerated. In discussing the paranoid schizoid position, Klein also described the infant's need to mentally deny aspects of the self that are threatening to his or her sense of security, aspects that are too much to bear. In the second state or way of relating to the world, the position Klein called the depressive position, okay, not to be confused with depression, feelings are taken back reclaimed, re-owned. They no longer have to be projected, but can be experienced as belonging to the self. Others are experienced as whole people with various qualities and characteristics. Some may be appreciated and some not, 
but good and bad qualities can coexist within the same person without one or more parts having to be disavowed. So it's a little more complex there, right? You understand them, they're wounded, you don't like some things they're doing, they're wounded, but they have some good qualities. If they were healed, they wouldn't be doing it. They're crying for love or homotromicus. In this position, opportunities for mourning, repair, and learning from past experience becomes possible. Also, thinking re-emerges or is restored in this state. And so more reasonable thinking takes place in the depressive position, whole object relating. Broadly defined, defined broadly, Object representation refers to the conscious and unconscious mental schemata. Okay, schema, script, right? Templates, etc. The neurotic client who develops a transference neurosis in which the therapist is experienced as a new addition of the parents and thus an object of life force uh, or expressing your anger, your love or hate, put it that way, right? So the neurotic client who develops a transference in which the therapist is experienced as a new addition of the parents, and that's an object of the cry for love or your hate and not getting their love. Okay, Aletha Horner, let's end up with her. The first meeting between client and therapist, both come into the situation with a variety of wishes and hopes, fears and dreads, already in place. Right? It's already in place. Okay, both. So they're meeting for the first time, right? They're meeting for the first, uh, she made the joke about a blind date or something. You're like, okay, you're meeting for the first time. You don't know each other. Meeting for the first time. Okay. Both come into the situation with a variety of wishes and hopes. Fears and dreads already in place. These will be consistent with the individual's inner world of self and object and the emotional and dynamic interplay between them. So we bring with us into each new situation our, our template, our psychological template, our interpsychic world, our fears, hopes, wishes, fears, dreads. We bring that into the present. The other person brings that into the present. So object, what does object mean? The internal object means the intrapsychic version of significant others. The intrapsychic version of significant others. So the baby doesn't just internalize uh, a mother directly as the mother is. He internalizes his fantasies of her in. His fantasies of the mother is a monster. That's what he has. That's the internal object. So the internal object is wildly exaggerated. It doesn't represent the actual mother. The mother doesn't want to hurt the baby, but inside the baby thinks mother wants to hurt him. And this, is a, this affects our judgment, our way of thinking later on, right? Because of that. Okay, this yeah. Uh, uh, tell you the truth, yeah. I'm, I'm having an off day today. I feel I feel like uh, yeah. This is uh, my delivery today is really kind of a, uh, once in a while. And I tell you the truth, uh, I've done a lot of good videos. I would say I've done some excellent videos. Today today doesn't feel like today doesn't feel doesn't feel like today's one of them. Yeah. Let's see, let's, let's, okay, let's see. Okay, I would say um, this quote by Messina here about Melanie Klein's theory about the positions is okay. I like the first two, okay? The first two here by uh, Bagnini. Yeah, Bagnini is good, the first two. This, okay, this issue of the pre -edible. So she was saying, uh, when the therapist looks at the clients, she considers that. Are they more in the pre area, meaning wanting everything, the paranoid schizoid position, more dramatic, either or thinking, very demanding, um, right? immense narcissistic injury fears, and 
or are they more, can they make an I statement? So can the therapist teach them how to make an I statement? Okay, so if this happened, it reminded you of the past. As a child, you had these unmet needs, feelings came about, this is what's coming up. And you share this kind of thing, you can make I statements. That's the depressive position. Clingers can make, clingers and pleasers and caretakers, they can make, they can make I statements. Stingers, no way, no way. Uh, they rejected all that because the, the feeling realm was rejected in them early on and they identified with the, with the rejector and that's the loyalty of the mother so that's why they can't make I statements because they think they're being disloyal to the mother if they're disloyal to the mother they have no mother so they can't make I statements so stingers don't make I statements so that's considered so-called pre oedipal realm or the mother complex basically So this jargon, again, um, so Jocasta, um, was the, um, her husband was Elias, the two of them had two children. Their daughter was Electra, the son was Oedipus, right? So, um, if a mother uses the Jocasta style of mothering, the son, will, the son will have a mother complex, so he was Oedipus, right? The daughter will have the Electra complex. This means, that the child, either the boy or the girl, Electra or Oedipus, didn't get enough love to know themselves. So they have the mother complex. The daughter, Electra, grows up, she's gonna have the Jocasta complex. She'll be like Jocasta. The son grows up, will be like the father, Laius. So both Laius and Jocasta rejected. Remember the story? They rejected the kid. The baby was sent into the hills and all this, right? And then uh, that's, that's the unconscious. Okay, this whole issue of um, the key being under mother's pillow, like the golden balls in a cage, we need the key. So in myths and fairy tales, if there's a story about a golden ball locked in a cage, like the Iron John one, the protagonist learns that in order to get his golden ball, he first needs to get the key. He learns that it's under his mother's pillow. Under, dark, means unconscious. Mother's unconscious. Okay, the key is there. Meaning, the mother used the baby to meet her unconscious needs, and the key is there. That recognition, you get the key, okay, you recognize it. Unconscious to conscious, now, now you can get your feelings back. You can get your golden ball back, your body back. If you admit, if you admit, how? What does that mean, the mother used the baby to meet her unconscious needs? What does that mean? Okay, there's four, let's see, about five minutes? Maybe only five minutes. Okay, just quickly. The mother has a record herself, right? She has a baby. She replaced the record. What's on her record? It may be that on the record it says that mother shamed her. In this situation, she's going to play the shaming mother who shames her. But she rejects, she can't feel that. So the baby's a safe, non-threatening substitute other into whom the mother projects her wounded, lost self into. So she plays the shaming mother who shames her, but she already sees herself into the baby. So to shame herself, she's shaming the baby because she sees herself in the baby, so she's shaming the baby. So that means she's using the baby to try to meet her unconscious deed, to replay what had happened to her with her grand fantasy, that by doing so she can change her past. Case scenario one. How does the baby feel by this? Of course the baby's golden ball gets locked in a cage, and the key is under mother's pillow. Case scenario B is some mothers have a baby and say, at last, at last, somebody they can brainwash and condition to always be at her beck and call, be dependent on her, never let her feel alone, respect her, respond to her, do what she says, be there for her, right? So she's parentifying the baby. She wants the baby to take care of her. So she's using the baby to meet her unconscious needs because she herself didn't get a positive mother experience. She thinks she can recreate that by brainwashing the baby. Very easy for the mother to do. Very corrupt if she does this, right? So how does the baby feel in this process? Okay, the baby's golden ball gets locked in a cage. The key is under the pillow. Case scenario C, okay, because the connection, because the attachment is insecure, the baby's gonna be crying. Okay? The mother says, hey, what are you crying about? Wait a minute, you don't like me, baby? The mother projects her rejecting mother onto the baby and thinks the baby's rejecting her. 
Well, she's talking about how her mother rejected her. How does the baby feel by this? And then, case scenario D, she attacks the baby, thinking she's fighting with the mother. How does the baby feel by all this? So let's back up for a second and give the baby a voice. Case scenario A, mother, what are you doing here? I'm not you from 20 plus years ago. I'm me, I'm your child, I'm not you. Okay, so the baby thinks, what kind of mother, what, what is my mother doing here? She doesn't see me for who I am. She thinks I'm her from 20 plus years ago and she's gonna play her shaming mother and replay what had happened to her by placing me in the role of her and she plays the shaming mother and she's gonna shame me because she's replaying the record that she has of how the mother shamed her. What are you doing, mother? Hold the phone here. I'm, I can't, don't make me play you from 20 plus years ago and you replay your drama with your mother using me. So the child is very uh, troubled by this. He may think his mother's psychotic. Case scenario B, baby says, hold the phone, mother. I can't be the good mother that you need 20 plus years ago. I'm your baby. I need you, I need you to be a mother for me. Don't expect me to be a mother for you. Mother tries to brainwash the baby. What do you, don't brainwash me to take care of you. I, I can't do that. Baby thinks my mother's psychotic. Case scenario C. No, baby, no, mother, I, I'm not crying because I'm rejecting you. I'm crying because I'm in pain because you're not meeting my needs. You think I'm, oh, oh my God, Ma, are you psychotic? I'm not your mother. I'm not my grandmother. I'm your baby here. Baby the child thinks, oh my God, is my mother psychotic? And then case scenario D, the mother's uh, criticizing the baby for this. No, don't blame me for crying, thinking you're fighting with your mother. I'm in, okay, again, baby thinks mother psychotic. In the child's psychology, uh, Hedges calls it a psychotic pocket into which the child's golden ball goes down. Goes, that's the forest, unconscious, a cage, locked. Okay, and then pain so utter, swallow substance up, the child goes in a swoon, emotional catatonia, emotional hypothermia, numb, okay, etc. So this, this is uh, Lawrence Hedges' theory. Uh, talks about this idea. Interesting, uh, interesting theory in that category. So that, to, so to get the golden ball back, uh, we need, we need to consider this, or at least possibly entertain this idea. Somehow, be a detective. Why? Let's say the mother. Let's say we get to a place where the mother didn't meet the baby's needs. Why? Now, be a detective. Why didn't the mother offer a secure attachment stuff? Okay, understand her. Be a psychological detective. Okay, find out your mother's favorite jokes, her earliest memories. Um, is she a stinger or a clinger? If both parents are stingers, they have scapegoat hunger. That whole area. Oh yeah, we didn't talk about that this time. That's an important one about the scapegoat hunger. When two stinger, when two stinger parents uh, get married and they have a kid, they're going to scapegoat one of their children. That's a whole. That's a whole topic there. A good place to start is on YouTube, Bruce Springsteen, uh, Independence Day, the song Independence Day, Toronto, the intro he gives to that song. Start there. Okay, in other words, he, sa he starts us off, that one there. And we have a whole thread on how to forgive our parents. So it's an active process and it's a, and there's an emotional byproduct of it, the forgiveness. There's a both of it. There's a yin and the yang in the forgiveness. You gotta do both. You gotta have both. Huh? Okay, five minutes left. Not even five minutes. I think it's going to cut out like 208 or something, 8 or 9 or something like that. Well, uh, you know, the truth is, I went to the first venue, all three spots were taken. So I came to this other venue, and then the, the nice manager, she was very polite about it. She said, Sorry, sir, we can, you know, we, we can no longer let you um, do your, you know, at the, at the window there. We'll give you a little table, you can enjoy it, you can enjoy the. You can do it in public like the rest of us. <laughs> but, uh... So the search continues. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna find a nice venue. Somewhere, somehow, I'll find a, a little used coffee shop somewhere. I wanna bring in the good speaker, play some nice music. Uh, I wanna get it to a flow. Um, I don't want to have these running commentary thoughts or oh, time is running out, can I squeeze it in? Should I redo this video? Should I do a part two or just keep it as part one? I don't want to have these like back thoughts. I want to relax. Because if I can relax and uh, just not worry about time and logistics and place and interrupting people, moving around, 
If I can get into that kind of space, uh, my videos are much better. There's a bit of a flow. Uh, my anxiety is reduced. Um, so I'm trying to get to that place where I can get there. So, uh, I, th I think uh, personally the best takeaway is the first one here. The second one. Maybe these middle ones. And I think the I think the, the long one there by Messini. Messina. And just the overall appreciation that we bring our intrapsychic world into the present. We transfer the past into the present. Okay? Interpersonal leads to intrapsychic, which expresses itself interpersonally. Okay? As above, so below, and then inside out. Huh? Just this basic uh, message, right? And all of these quotes are kind of like little details about it, just trying to spell it out. Kind of oh, I missed one here. Volet Doa. Here's an interesting definition. Bagnis, Bagnini uh, has one here. Volet Doa. Madness of two individuals merging unconscious traumatic experience. That's one way, but I couldn't quite. I didn't look into it fully, but if the couple has trauma, if he has trauma, she has trauma, and somehow you're, you're re reliving each other's trauma together, it may get to a point where his